Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Bernadette Lim, Program Manager for the Telehealth Immersion Program, and today I will be co-presenting with my colleague, Lindsay Carlisari, Research and Policy Manager at the AMA. In today's Telehealth Immersion Program session, we will be highlighting current telehealth trends and implications for the future by walking through key findings gathered from the AMA Telehealth Survey we recently fielded at the end of 2021. By way of background, this survey was conducted in follow-up to the COVID-19 Healthcare Coalition Telehealth Impact Survey fielded in 2020, and all trends, trend comparisons we will be highlighting today are in reference to this report. Before getting started, I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to all of you who participated in the survey. I also wanted to extend a sincere thank you to the Telehealth Immersion Program collaborators listed on the screen here that helped to promote the survey to members. Thank you for making this report possible. Throughout today's presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to drop it in the chat or, or the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll re reserve time at the end to answer those. I'll now turn it over to Lindsay, who will share details on survey methodology, respondent demographics, and telehealth use. Thank you, Bernadette. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. It's nice to have so many of you here to listen in. I'll start out with a, little, a bit of background on the survey and data collection to get us going. Um, the AMA conducts a survey to gather insights on the use of telehealth to inform our ongoing telehealth research, uh, advocacy, resource development, and to guide the AMA's continued support for physicians, practices, and health systems. We published this survey online and distributed it via email and social media with support from state and specialty medical organizations and members of our telehealth immersion program that you saw in the earlier slide. Responses included in this report are from just over 2,300 physicians. And while we did collect responses from other clinician types, they are not included here due to small sample sizes. So just wanna make that note upfront. This is all physician responses. Finally, we will reference this throughout the report, but it's important to note upfront that this data is based on, physician, on a physician survey. Um, it's not a cost, patient satisfaction, or outcome analysis. And this means that all data presented is based on physician sentiments, perceptions, and opinions, and um, importantly, should, not, uh, should be considered directional and not necessarily applicable to the general healthcare professional population. Just to set up the information we'll present today, here's a quick look at the sample demographics. As you can see, the majority of respondents were over the age of 50. There were also more male respondents than other genders, and the majority of respondents identified as white. In looking at the practice characteristics, here we show the respondents were pretty evenly split between suburban and urban locations, with a smaller portion practicing in rural settings. The most selected practice types were single specialty group practice, teaching hospital, multi-specialty group practice, and solo physician practice. Now I'll get into more into the survey details, starting with general findings about use. At the time of the survey, 85% of respondents reported using telehealth to care for their patients. Of the 15% that report not to currently use telehealth, less than half indicated that they did at some point during the pandemic. We asked this question um, because it was important for us to identify if physicians were only using telehealth temporarily during times of high need in the pandemic. So while you can see most physicians are currently using telehealth, there remains a subset who probably did out of necessity, but have since gone back to in-person care. Most respondents report, oops, excuse me, we also asked participants whether their use of telehealth has decreased since they first began offering it. And while it was fairly evenly split, uh, slightly more indicated that their use has decreased. Most physicians report that the decrease in telehealth use is a matter of having a mix of in-person and virtual visits, but other frequently reported reasons were a preference to provide care in person and a patient preference to be seen in person. A little more than one in five respondents reported that more than 80% of their patient visits are done via telehealth. And I'll show you here, and uh, nearly half 
reported using telehealth for 20% or less of their patient visits. And I know this is a lot of information on this slide, so I'll just um, stay there for a minute so you can look at that one. Most respondents, 63% to be specific, indicate that 75% or more of their telehealth visits are with established patients. And this is an increase of more than 12% from our 2020 survey. Not too surprisingly, physicians are primarily located in their clinic during their virtual visits, although a significant number also reported seeing patients virtually from their own homes. And uh, respondents indicated that their patients are primarily receiving virtual care from their homes. And next, I will hand it back to Bernadette to go into some of the more in-depth findings. All right, so taking a closer look at what clinical care services are currently being provided via telehealth, we are seeing three out of four respondents indicate use for medical and chronic disease management. Nearly one out of two respondents report use of telehealth for specialty care and mental and behavioral health care. And one out of three use telehealth for outpatient acute care, preventative or primary care, care coordination, and hospital ED follow-up. In terms of aspects of care, the majority of respondents report providing treatment or therapy, screening assessment or diagnosis, follow-up care, and continuous monitoring. Additionally, nearly half report to use telehealth for triaging care. When it comes to the specific use cases physicians felt were most appropriate for telehealth, we received a variety of responses across specialties. The most commonly shared applications include family planning, management of seizure disorders, including epilepsy, migraines and headaches, prenatal care, stroke care, ADHD, substance use disorder, eczema, acne, rashes, diabetes, asthma, and blood pressure management. Of note, many mentioned that these are the specific use cases that work best at this time, given the current technology adoption being mostly live audiovisual and audio only. Looking ahead, 70% of physicians report their organization's leadership is interested in continuing to offer telehealth, and 56% of physician respondents are personally motivated to increase use of telehealth in their practice. Along the same lines, respondents plan to continue offering many, many of the services they currently offer um, via telehealth in the future, with primary reasons being telehealth reduces patient barriers to accessing care, reduces costs to the patient, such as transportation costs or taking time off work, and overall increases patient satisfaction. Many also feel telehealth has been proven to be both operationally and clinically effective. Diving deeper into each element of the quadruple aim, nearly 60% of physicians agree or strongly agree telehealth has enabled them to provide more comprehensive quality care. Of note, physicians mentioned the benefit of being able to see patients in their home environment and observing environmental and lifestyle factors that affect the patient's health. Survey respondents also mentioned the ability to obtain a more accurate blood pressure reading by assisting patients to measure in a more comfortable, more relaxed environment, such as the home. While overall, we are seeing a positive impact on cost of care, I did want to make mention here that many practices and health systems are working to measure comprehensive value that virtual care provides. Some of you may know last year, the AMA, together with Manat Health, published the Return on Health Report that includes a framework to measure the value of virtual care beyond just dollars and cents. The research recognized the need for in-person and virtually enabled care to be additionally integrated and that the mode of care delivery is based on clinical appropriateness. So right time, right place, right modality of care, while also considering factors such as cost and convenience. I also wanted to make note here that the AMA is collecting nationwide, nationwide case studies through our physicians, physicians Grassroots Campaign and through several other programs and initiatives. We next plan to work with specialty societies and practices to additionally determine how virtual care will impact the total cost of care as well as support guidance for clinical appropriateness. 
Moving along to the third quadrant of the quadruple aim, more than 80% of respondents agree or strongly agree patients have better access to care since using telehealth, which is a 12% increase from the prior year. Additionally, 62% of respondents agree or strongly agree patients are more satisfied since using telehealth. It's no surprise here that physicians say access to care is a key feature that drives patient satisfaction. Some examples that highlight increased access and improved satisfaction include reduced wait times for first-time specialty care consultations and the convenience of telehealth for patients with disabilities and or limited mobility. Just over half of physician respondents agree or strongly agree that telehealth has increased their professional satisfaction. Of note, physicians emphasize the professional benefit of having remote work as an option, especially as they juggle professional and family obligations. The featured quotes here show two separate individuals who call out that having telehealth as a modality to deliver patient care has actually kept them from leaving practice or retiring early. When it comes to telehealth adoption, the vast majority indicate they are beyond the implementation phase. Many indicate that they are currently optimizing existing telehealth operations. Some are looking to expand current telehealth offerings, and nearly 70% of respondents share they are focusing on sustaining telehealth. When asked if they are measuring the value of virtual care, the majority, which is over 70%, indicate they are measuring at least one of the following listed on the screen. Over half report to specifically collect patient satisfaction and access to care metrics. And with that, Lindsay, I'll turn it back over to you to take a look closer look at the technology being used and highlight recognized barriers and challenges. Okay, thanks, Bernadette. Um, now we'll take a closer look at the survey results related to the technology aspects of telehealth use. 93% of our survey respondents report conducting live, audiovisual, and interactive telehealth visits, which is 13% more than respondents in the 2020 survey. Nearly 70% report using telephone-only calls to provide virtual care. And um, notably, only 8% of physician respondents said they were using remote patient monitoring at this time, which is a decrease of 4% from 2020. We asked participants about the platforms they use to conduct virtual care and found that telephone and Zoom topped the list as the most used platforms, followed by Doximity and EHR-based telehealth tools. More than half of respondents access their virtual care technology directly from their EHR, but almost as many report that they can't, so there are still opportunities for improved integration. While most respondents indicated that they don't use any technology to augment their telehealth services at this time, some did report using smartphone photographs and clinical tools such as uh, blood pressure cuffs, pulse oximeters, and scales to support their virtual care services. Unfortunately, most report that the data from these tools is not automatically delivered to them, which may limit their utility and ease of use for many clinicians. Next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the barriers and challenges that uh, survey responses identified. We asked participants about the barriers they believe patients face in the use of telehealth. The top reported barriers were limited access to technology and broadband internet, limited digital literacy, and even a preference for in-person visits. There were sentiments expressed that patients, that many patients will be left behind if telehealth continues to advance without providing patients the right kind of education and technology training to be able to access it and use it appropriately. Here we show just a few quotes from the free text portion of the survey that emphasize these concerns. Respondents were also asked about barriers their organizations might face in continuing to offer telehealth. Perhaps not surprising, barriers selected most frequently revolved around coverage and reimbursement, uh, particularly the potential rollback of policies implemented during the COVID-19 pandemic that temporarily expand coverage. Some respondents also identified opportunities to improve telehealth workflows 
including separate schedule blocks for telehealth visits, formalized check-in and check-out processes, additional staffing, training, and technology that enables a digital waiting room function. Some of the qualitative input we received from respondents emphasizes an apprehension among physicians that even basic telephone only visits will no longer be covered. Physicians express a desire for continued coverage of these audio only visits, especially for ensuring access to care for those that may not use computers or can't otherwise access in-person care. And Bernadette, I'll hand it back to you to wrap the uh, discussion of our findings up, and then we'll take some time to answer some questions. Great, thanks, Lindsay. So just to wrap up um, our presentation portion for today, and again, we wanna make sure we answer any questions that you might have on the report that's available. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few take home points. Just wanted to highlight a few take home points from our survey findings for us to just keep in mind as we look towards the future. So overall, um, one key takeaway from the survey is that physicians have enthusiastically embraced telehealth and expect to increase use moving forward. As we mentioned, nearly 85% of physician respondents um, are currently using telehealth to care for patients and nearly 70% report their organization is motivated to continue use of telehealth in the future. With this in mind, it's important that we continue to support practice implementation and optimization efforts. Here at the AMA, this further supports the ongoing need and investment for programs such as this one, as well as additional research and the continued development of resources. As physicians and practices plan to expand telehealth services, they see widespread adoption hinges on preventing a return to the previous lack of insurance coverage and little to no payer reimbursement. That being said, we encourage payers, both public and private, to continue evaluating and improving policies, coverage and payment rates for services provided via telehealth, including audio only, to ensure equitable access. Fewer than half of respondents report being able to access all of their telehealth platforms via the EHR, and more than 75% report that their support technology does not automatically collect and deliver patient reported data. There's an opportunity here for improved interoperability between platforms and support technology, and that would help to improve and streamline telehealth services for all. According to the survey, 95% of physicians reported patients are primarily located at their home at the time of the virtual visit. Allowing patients to be in their home is a key component in making telehealth more accessible. The omnibus spending bill recently passed provides a temporary extension in allowing Medicare patients to receive telehealth services anywhere they are located, including the home. And the AMA will continue to urge Congress to make this permanent, along with other policies that offer coverage and convenience to patients. In terms of barriers, the top three patient barriers to using telehealth reported include access to, to technology, digital literacy, and broadband internet access. The AMA will continue to advocate for equitable access for under-resourced patient populations and communities. This includes, but is not limited to, supporting increased funding and planning for telehealth infrastructures, such as broadband internet and internet connected devices. And lastly, our findings suggest that there is no shortage of research on telehealth that the physician community is interested in. This includes taking a closer look at the impact of telehealth on equity, quality, cost, patient satisfaction, disparities in reimbursement, best practices, implementation science, and clinical appropriateness. At the AMA, we will continue to expand our research with partners to help broaden this field of knowledge and encourage other stakeholders to do the same. And with that, um, we'll go ahead and just open it up for any questions. So I did see some come through in the Q&A section and I'll um, start with one that I think is fairly easy. Um, we asked, um, Peter Kaplan asked if we ask which telehealth platforms were used and we did and there was one slide um, that I, I did briefly go over but I can, go back to it and show you a little bit in more in depth on that information. Um, we talked, we asked about the use of FaceTime and um, so let's see, if we can get back to that. So here, hopefully you can see this. Um, 
we asked about specific platforms and, and if this may not be answering your question, if so, just put that in the, in the Q&A section, I can try to elaborate a little bit further. Um, you can see fewer responses for things like Skype and um, FaceTime, patient portals um, down at the bottom, um, you can see the fewer responses there, but for the most part, it was through a telehealth vendor, Doximity, Zoom, um, audio only telephone, telephone visits seem to be the most common. Doxy.me was another one. Um, and I think these were the, these were the options that were, that had answers to them selected. So, um, there were at the bottom, you can see other platforms request or mentioned in the free text, um, WebEx, eClinical Works, and just another one set, a few others that were. Uh, mentioned in the free text portion. Um, there's a question here around just codes for audio only. Um, we can connect with you offline and provide that. Question about, do we need a special contract with health plans to use telemedicine? I believe that the answer for that is no, that you wouldn't need a special contract, although coverage of telehealth services would be determined by the um, codes used and the person's policy. Um, I don't know if um, if there's any any more elaboration on that. You would know Bernadette, but I'm not sure. Uh, that's a pretty straightforward answer. There's a question here from Karen. Are you planning on conducting studies on functionality and patients' experience with telehealth in terms of usability and ease of use? I think that's a great question and something that um, we don't currently have planned, but um, you know, I think that's that is important and something that we'll continue to look forward to. So, you know, I think there's lots of organizations that might be joining us that um, if you're doing this kind of work, um, we'd love to be in touch. Aaron asked a question about when physicians refer to audio only coverage, do they prefer the telephone e &M codes or other codes? Um, I don't know the answer to this and it's a good question. I'd like to be able to follow up with you after if that's okay, um, I can get in touch. I'll do a little looking on that and see if there's some folks in our CPT and coding area that might be able to help me give a good answer to that. So um, please hold on that one and I'll get back to you. What are you learning about needs to improve teamwork among members of the care team to support um, the use and implementation and sustainability of telehealth, including teamwork with the patient caregivers? And that, that's also a really good question and something that we, um, we might, Bernadette, actually think about including questions about teamwork and, and the use of telehealth in our future surveys. Um, I don't have a great answer to that question now, right now because we haven't included we haven't asked questions specifically about um, teamwork and the use of support staff in, in telehealth, but I think it's a good question and I'm glad um, someone raised it because it's something we should continue to think about. Obviously the AMA is a, a big proponent of team-based care and integration and use of, um, of clinical support staff and freeing up physician time uh, to be able to provide better patient care. So I think it's something that we should continue to look at. Yeah, I'll just add to that, Lindsay. Um, abs it's absolutely critical. And actually like on the pre one of the slides that Lindsay had shared around the um, opportunities for improved telehealth workflows in the practice, that included um, just coordination among staff and um, just really nailing that down. Bernadette, are you familiar with Doximity video? Yeah, yeah, it's an it's a platform that's available. Um, and yeah, it is it's a Zoom competitor. Is that the question from Karen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, is there pre preliminary research on clinical appropriateness? Um, we're we're conduct we're looking at that right now. We're 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 trying to work with the different specialty societies to understand what's currently available. Um, but I think that this is something that will emerge here, you know, in, in the near future. Thank you, Meg. Um our, our vice president of digital health is listening in on this call and she put a link in the chat to the telehealth quick guide um, that I'd like to point out and make sure that everyone accesses it has resources and information on payment and coverage. And then I also did put a link into the chat to the report where we published the findings of this survey. We won't be um, providing this exact presentation afterwards, but the all of the things that you 
saw in our presentation today are in the report that's published online already. So you should be able to get out there on that link that I put in the chat. Okay, I see there's a question about um, reducing a measurement on reducing family caregiver burden. And I think that's a, an interesting and thoughtful question as well. We didn't um, have any information on that in this survey, but I think that is a good, good thing to continue to think about for our future surveys. So um, we have a question around in your findings, is there a concern among physicians about what will or won't be permitted once the public health emergency is over, specific modalities, licensure, et cetera. And the answer to that is yes, there is a major concern about um, what will be continued, what will be allowed in the future. Um, and we're advocating for continued coverage. Okay. Um, those are all the questions that we had. And then um, I know there was a couple of AMA colleagues on the line as well. If there's anything you want to add, um, feel free. Bernadette, this is Meg, and I would just add, um, related to the caregiver question, I put some information in the chat related to our AMA return on health research that we have done, which in essence is a value framework for measuring more so the comprehensive value that virtual care can and is uh, beginning to create inclusive of for physicians, for caregivers, for patients, for other members of the care team as well. So I put that information in the chat and welcome any additional questions on that. Meg, do you know if in that offhand, um, someone, I see a question about clinical pharmacists being included as team members. Um, is there any inclusion of those as part of a traditional uh, team approach with this? Yeah, so that's definitely come up. And I think that's an area of opportunity for us to explore as it relates to our telehealth immersion program and content that we're building out um, for the telehealth immersion program. So welcome thoughts. And um, we definitely uh, ask that others reach out to us for other topic areas of interest. For the return on health report, while pharmacists were not an explicit stakeholder group that we included, we did include other members of the care team and just perspectives, as well as patients, caregivers, vendors themselves, health system executives, um, and of course, physicians. And then Dana and Kim, I know you guys are on. Is there anything that you wanted to share? Feel free. I'm just looking. I see some, some people did put um, questions in the chat instead of the Q&A. So I'm just um, looking through these to see if there's anything we can answer quickly. Bison, I know you're asking a question around um, any additional cost benefit studies to debate telehealth payment parity prior to the pandemic. Many health um, plans who cover telehealth were paying 80 to 85% of in-person visits. So yes, absolutely. We're taking a closer look at the cost benefit um, and we're trying to work together with um, several collaborators on that. Someone added, um, Taylor added to the uh, question about contracting and rights uh, regarding the contracting question. It depends on the specific plan. Um, like I said, some plans might require an addendum for telehealth coverage depending on the date of the contract. And um, clinicians should contact their provider rep at each payer if they have questions. So that's good, a good note to add. Thank you. All right. Um, Lindsay, do you see any others that? I think there are a couple that we can um, follow up with afterwards, like I mentioned, but um, nothing that I think, I think we addressed everything else. Okay. Um, and then the, there's a one last question around the recording. So yes, we will record this. Um, we, we've recorded this presentation and we'll make it available to all the participants. Yeah, thank you, Meg, for adding all the good links in the chat. I appreciate that backup information. Well, if there's nothing else, I think we can um, wrap up. Thank you everyone for, for participating with us today. Um, Bernadette, I will let you go ahead and close up. Great, so our next event will be held on April 20th and will highlight telehealth use in emergency medicine. Registration is now available and can be accessed on our website. And we've put a QR code on the screen that you can scan using your phone. Once exiting today's webinar, there will be a brief four question feedback survey. Your feedback's important to us and we thank you in advance for completing that survey. 
Um, and with that, um, we'll close today's session. Thank you all for joining us. Um, feel free to contact us with any additional questions. Um, and we hope you all have a great day. Thank you.